So we're going to zoom way out. And first, let's just define what inflammation is in general. So generally speaking, inflammation is part of our innate immune system. Our innate immune system is like our first line of defense against foreign invaders, bacteria, infections, and tissue damage. So what that means is whenever you have a foreign invader or you have tissue damage, this activates our immune innate immune response. And once our innate immune response is activated, it deploys immune cells, also known as white blood cells. They first eliminate whatever is attacking the body, the foreign invader or the tissue damage, clean up the area of any dead tissue, and they start the repair process. And then in most important what happens next is they are meant to leave the area. When these neutrophils or these immune cells do not leave the area, that is when we develop something called chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is when these immune cells kind of outstay their welcome. And when these neutrophils stick along around too long, they just repeatedly produce and release pro-inflammatory cytokines. And in turn, what this creates is damage to healthy tissues. Now, depending on what system is involved, the mechanisms are a little bit different in how this innate immune response works. When we're talking about blood vessels and chronic inflammation, if these immune cells stick around too long in the blood vessels, they actually stick to the sides of the blood vessels. These turn into foam cells. Foam cells turn into plaques. Plaques then further release immune cells, which keeps this inflammatory or immune process firing, which creates further destruction or damage to the cells, cell walls, which actually causes the cell walls to stiffen. The reason stiff blood vessels are a problem is that blood vessels are supposed to dilate when our blood pressure rises to accommodate for this increased blood flow. When our blood vessel walls do not do that, if our blood pressure goes up or our heart rate goes up, that's when bad things happen. The other thing that happens is these plaques, due to a variety of circumstances also related to this innate inflammatory uh, process, is that they rupture and they break off. And then that's when you have a clot. If the clot happens in the heart, it's called a heart attack. If the clot happens in the brain, that is when you have a stroke. That is extremely simplified, but that is kind of normal inflammation gone wrong and turning into chronic inflammation when it comes to the blood vessels. Chronic inflammation is highly correlated with cardiovascular disease. When it comes to our brain or our nervous system, these pro-inflammatory or these immune cells sticking around too long lead to conditions such as Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Now there's one other thing when it comes to chronic inflammation and that is a hypoxia induced inflammatory response. Hypoxia is lack of oxygen in the tissues of the body or a higher oxygen demand than supply. And hypoxia can also activate this innate immune response. Now, when it comes to hypoxia-induced inflammation and stroke, big picture, and I know I talk about this a lot, but it's always good to review. A stroke is, an ischemic stroke is when a plaque dislodges or you end up with a blood clot in a blood vessel in the brain. That cuts off blood flow to cells in the brain. When blood flow is cut off, that cuts off oxygen, so those cells become oxygen deprived, and that is what activates the immune response in the brain. Now, the brain has its own kind of immune system, so it activates that brain immune system via the microglia in the brain, which are kind of like the brain immune cells. The other thing that occurs is these microglia start to do their innate immune response thing. They break down the blood-brain barrier, and the blood-brain barrier stops or prevents stuff from getting into the brain, almost like a protective layer for the brain. And then through a cascade of events that also activates the peripheral immune system. But long story short, when it comes to this is there is documentation that even decades after a stroke, they find these immune cells diffusely in the blood vessels in the brain. 
They also find foam cells in the brain, which I told you is kind of like a precursor to plaques in the brain. And they find lymphocytes in the blood vessels in the brain, which is part of our, what they call your adaptive immune system. So you have your innate immune system. And then if stuff slips through the cracks and gets past the innate immune system, you have the adaptive immune system, which is kind of like a more robust immune system that um, is like your special ops like you would have in the military. And they have a specific bacteria or infection that they target. And so one belief is, is that these lymphocytes that are now in the brain decades later could be potentially damaging healthy nerve cells in the brain. The important thing to understand, your stroke could potentially have created a chronic inflammation situation, not just in your brain, but it really does affect almost every tissue in the body. All right, now just a couple more things about hypoxia and inflammation or hypoxia induced inflammatory response is when it comes to obesity. Now, I know we talk about obesity a lot, but I don't think we always kind of explain why obesity leads to so many chronic diseases, but obesity or adipose cells or fat cells in particular, if you have kind of an apple shape, you that means you have more fat cells around your organs. The, those fat cells around your organs or really anywhere in your body when they expand, they actually kind of fill up all the space and they create a hypoxic environment and create, again, uh, an innate immune response that turns into chronic inflammation where these cells, immune cells, linger too long and start destroying healthy tissues. So I know there's a lot of information, but in summary, the key takeaways is that inflammation, acute inflammation is good. Inflammation responds to tissue damage, foreign invaders, or toxins. It activates an immune response. Our immune system will deploy immune cells. Immune cells will come into the area. They will eliminate the causative factor. They will start to clean up the area and they will start the repair process. Bad news is when they linger too long, they start to cause damage to healthy tissues. The way you keep this in balance is that your pro-inflammatory cytokines are balanced with your anti-inflammatory cytokines to prevent this acute inflammatory response from turning into chronic inflammation. The other key takeaway is post-stroke, so anyone who's had a stroke, you have experienced a dysfunctional immune response due to lack of oxygen in those nerve cells in your brain. This could potentially not just cause damage in the weeks and the months following your stroke, but also potentially could contribute to degradation of many neural networks in your brain, even decades after your stroke. So getting chronic inflammation under control is super, super important. All right. So now that we understand what inflammation is, what chronic inflammation is, how do you know if you are someone who has chronic inflammation? Well, some of the signs of chronic inflammation are insulin resistance or decreased insulin sensitivity. Sensitivity. So this doesn't necessarily mean you're diabetic because a lot of patients will tell me that you're not diabetic, but insulin resistance is a precursor for diabetes. And talk to your doctor about that when they're going over your labs with you and ask them, am I insulin resistant? A lot of times doctors wait until things are actually diagnosable before they talk to you about them. But look at your numbers, even get your lab results and go online and just Google this stuff so that you really understand what's going on inside of your body. But but insulin resistance is a sign of chronic inflammation or potentially chron could be a sign of chronic inflammation. Persisting or recurring infections is also a sign that you have a dysregulated or kind of a dysfunctional inflammatory response. Chronic pain has also been correlated with chronic inflammation. Now, keep in mind a lot of the stuff that we're going to go over from this point in the video moving forward, there's correlation and there's causation, and it's really hard to kind of tease these things apart. So I may say that this causes chronic inflammation or this is a sign of chronic inflammation, but a lot of times I think scientists are still trying to figure out, but they do know the things I'm going to talk about are strongly correlated. High cholesterol is also a sign of chronic inflammation. High blood pressure is a sign potentially of chronic inflammation. 
and visceral fat or kind of like an apple shaped body is a sign of chronic inflammation or is a risk factor for developing chronic inflammation and fatigue. If you had two or three things on that list, there is a high likelihood that you have a dysfunctional immune response and you have those immune cells sitting in healthy tissues or sitting near healthy tissues causing damage. So now let's talk about lifestyle and chronic inflammation. So first, we're going to just talk about chronic stress. So chronic stress does lead to chronic inflammation. Stress in general is a physical, chemical, or emotional stimulus that causes tension in the body. Stress in general activates our sympathetic nervous system. That's the sympathetic nervous system is part of our unconscious nervous system that activates that flight or fight response. So when we're in danger, it heightens our awareness to allow us to get out of danger and then it's supposed to quickly resolve or we're supposed to come back down to baseline. So when we're in that heightened state, our brain and our body release cortisol and adrenaline. Again, those kind of amp up our system, our heart rate increases, our blood sugar rises, and our immune system is suppressed. When we're in a chronic stress situation, that's when this becomes a problem. You do not want these elevated levels of cortisol and adrenaline just indefinitely in your system. And over time, it activates this immune response and keeps us in a perpetual chronic inflammatory state. So what do you do? We all have an opportunity, me included, to decrease the experiences or situations which keep us in a heightened state of arousal, i.e. stress. So some things to consider is mindfulness activities. Mindfulness is not necessarily sitting cross-legged, palms facing up in the air, although there is science that supports that. And I'm a huge advocate of that. If you have an opportunity to ever go to like a mindfulness workshop, there is a lot of science that supports all that. But for those of you who are skeptics or who aren't really into that, mindfulness is really just awareness conscious awareness of your thoughts your and your feelings. So awareness of your inner dialogue or what you're saying to yourself, catastrophizing. Do you say things to yourself like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be disabled forever, or this is the worst situation I've ever been in, or this experience is going to kill me. Those are kind of like our internal dialogue that can heighten our stress response. So being aware of what that repeated internal message is that you're telling yourself. Mindfulness is also just being aware of your relationships and how they affect you emotionally. Other things that are helpful for chronic stress are physical activity, hugely beneficial in decreasing your chronic stress response. Quality sleep is also important. So paying attention, making sure you're getting the seven to nine hours of sleep a night, having a sense of humor, being able to laugh at yourself, being able to laugh at the world uh, is hugely valuable in decreasing your chronic stress and having hobbies, doing things that you enjoy, doing things that bring your life meaning and purpose, also extremely valuable. Valuable. If you are someone who's a little bit further on in the disability scale or you have more physical disabilities, there is something that you can do. Maybe just problem solving would be a way to distract you or get your mind off your chronic stress to problem solve how you can do those things you enjoy with your current physical limitations. So continuing on the other area that's important when it comes to chronic inflammation are environmental toxins. So environmental toxins include pesticides, which primarily impact our lungs and our brain, water pollution, and air pollution. So construction sites, an office building, a work environment, vehicle exhaust, agriculture, and household products. So air fresheners, paint, cleaning supplies, and perfumes. There is always room to find something to make us just a little bit healthier. I always talk about this, but it's just finding those 1% areas. And to me, 
looking into the the things I'm inhaling or the things we're inhaling or the environments that we're in and avoiding them if possible is one area where you can have that make that 1% improvement. Next area is sleep. So seven to nine hours of quality sleep is super, super important. Now, water is also important to talk about or staying hydrated. Water clears toxins from our body, also decreasing the potential of activating that innate immune response. And being well hydrated supports the lymphatic system, which keeps those white blood cells moving. And that is super important. Remember, we don't want those things lingering. Now let's talk about food and I'm not going to do a deep dive because this isn't a video on nutrition necessarily, but the reason food's important is because everything that we put into our body in our mouth is either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory and there's really no in-between. So when it comes to food, there's pro-inflammatory foods and there is anti-inflammatory foods. Pro-inflammatory foods Big picture, if there's only one thing that you get from this section is processed foods, anything in a box, anything that can sit on a shelf for days or weeks at a time is considered a processed food and also processed meats. Anything, any lunch meat is also processed, is a processed food and hot dogs are also a processed food. So big picture, if there's anything you take away from this video, those are the things that you want to avoid. Now, if we break that down just a little bit more, the things that are considered kind of pro-inflammatory are trans fats. So trans fats are anything, any fat that is solid at room temperature. The reason trans fats are in so many foods, honestly, if you did not grow it and pick it yourself, it's probably inflammatory. That's, I'm kidding a little bit on that. But really anything that has gone through a third party from the farm to you is probably has something bad in it. But trans fats are cheap um, and they also keep maintain food shelf life. It also helps with the flavor and the texture of food. So that's why they are so prevalent in so many foods. But again, those are any fats that are solid at room temperature. So butter, margarine would be examples of that. Refined carbohydrates are also considered pro-inflammatory. So refined carbohydrate are your white flours and your pasta. So refined carbohydrate is when most of the fiber has been stripped off of that grain. Food, first of all, that doesn't have fiber. Fiber helps us to feel full so you don't reach that full feeling. So that's one downside. But also um, pro-inflammatory gut bacteria feed off of refined carbohydrates. So that's another reason is it creates an inflammatory situation in your stomach. Alcohol is probably a given that, that that it is inflammatory. It's actually toxic. So that's obviously going to also uh, trigger or activate an immune response. I already said this, but processed meats as well uh, is also going to trigger an immune response. So that's any of your deli meats and hot dogs. Now let's talk about anti-inflammatory foods. And again, if there's anything, if you learn nothing else from this video, the most important thing to know about anti-inflammatory foods is basically anything on the outside of the grocery store is most likely not processed, except for the deli section, because that's on the outside, I think, of all the grocery stores I go to. But anything on the outside of the grocery store, for the most part, does have a shelf life or is not as processed. So big picture. That would be if you only if you're just in the beginning stages and you were just kind of experimenting with this, start there. Now, if you want a little bit more in depth, uh, some other things that are anti-inflammatory are berries such as strawberries, blueberries, blackberries raspberries. They're all high in antioxidants. So antioxidants, which we really didn't go into, into in this video because I didn't really want to go too in depth, but anti antioxidants decrease oxidative stress, which is also something that is in the same family of kind of like a, a bad inflammatory response. So they all are considered anti-inflammatory. Cherries are also considered anti-inflammatory. Tomatoes, turmeric, extra virgin olive oil, preferably not heated. Once you heat olive oil, it loses some of its anti-inflammatory properties. So, you know, adding a little bit to salad dressing, things like that is better if you're going to use olive oil. 
green tea, avocado, fatty fish with omega-3s, such as salmon, sardines, herring, mackerel, and anchovies are all high in omega-3s. So that is another good food choice if you want to increase the amount of anti-inflammatory foods that you are consuming. And then, of course, we're going to talk about physical exercise. So I talked about it when I, as far as decreasing stress. They've also done studies on physical activity as well and how it relates to chronic inflammation. And they have taken people that were sedentary and put them into uh, programs where they boosted their physical activity and those people in these studies had a drop in their C-reactive protein or CRP and interleukin-6, which are two inflammatory markers. All right, so now that is everything I wanted to talk about about chronic inflammation, but there's one other thing I do want to mention and that is all of you who are either researching or you are doing what I consider novel treatments. So novel treatments would be HBOT or hyperbaric oxygen therapy, red light therapy, acupuncture, stem cell injections or types of therapies, or you are considering spending lots of your money to go to some guru somewhere who has some medical intervention that claims to get your brain to heal after a stroke or has claimed that they can reverse your MS. The one thing I would say about that is you have all of these tools at your disposal right now that you could be doing. And if it were me, if you are not doing a good percentage of everything that I just went through, I don't think there's any value in any of those novel treatments that I just mentioned. So any of those treatments that have studies that do show efficacy or do show that they change your disease process in some way, you the, the, the benefits, according to the data, are so low, they're not really clinically significant, that if you're doing those and you're not doing these other things, honestly, 1000%, I think you're wasting your money. So first, before we dive into oxidative stress, I just want to lay a foundation or paint a picture at what actually is going on under our skin that allows us to move. Plan movement, start movement, stop movement, grade movement. What, how does our brain or our body work that allows us to think, plan, reason, create memories, speak our native language? execute a plan. What? How does all of this happen? Well, it comes down to our brain, which is really the main hub or the command center of our body. So there's a lot of information that goes into the brain. So we call that those sensory neurons or sensory information. And then there's an output system, which is our motor system. That's extremely simplified and extremely big picture, but just to help you understand kind of how our body functions. And then Within that central nervous system, we have cells. So the main cell that is going to be the focus of our attention today are neurons. Those are the main cells. So a neuron has a cell body. And then the way that these signals travel is along long kind of wires, just like you have electrical wires called an axon that take a signal from one cell to another cell. And then we have a sheath around that axon that helps it to conduct, and that's called myelin. So most of you that have MS will kind of understand what that myelin is because that's the area of your ner central nervous system that has been impacted. So that is a big picture of how communication gets to and from the brain. And then beyond that, it's, it goes a little bit deeper into neural networks. So neurons in the brain communicate with each other as well to help us perform most of those functions that I mentioned earlier. But there's one other type of cell that's in the brain besides the neurons, and those are glial cells. And glial cells help to bring provisions. There's a glial cell that helps to bring provisions to the neuron from the blood vessels. Those are called astrocytes. And then the other one that's important for our discussion today are oligodendrocytes, which are the cells that make 
myelin. So super, super important, again, for those of you that have MS. And then also there are um, glial cells that are kind of like the immune system of the brain. So the brain has its own immune system, and that is going to be important in some of our discussion today as well. So now that we kind of have that lay of the land, when the brain is functioning properly or in quote unquote good health, we are in our neurons are in what we call homeostasis. So everything is nice and balanced. That's where we want to live when our neurons get out of homeostasis or out of whack, that is when problems happen. So really the cell's job throughout the day, again, is just to maintain that homeostasis. So now we're just going to go back to that neuron and we're going to go one layer deeper. So again, I told you that neuron is a cell body with a long string attached to it, like an electrical wire that's wrapped in what we call myelin, and myelin helps a signal to pass down that electrical wire. But all of these cells, they have mitochondria. So every cell in our body has mitochondria. The, the density of mitochondria or the concentration of mitochondria in each cell is different depending on the needs of that cell type. But mitochondria are basically the energy producers in the cell. So we, the type of energy that we use is ATP or adenosine triphosphate. For those of you that remember that from your high school or your college physiology class. The other thing that mitochondria do is they are kind of responsible for cell death. So when a cell is getting towards the end of its life, the mitochondria is what kind of initiates that cell's death. And there's other things that the mitochondria do, but that's the most important uh, function for our discussion today as it relates to oxidative stress. So one other thing that's important to know about mitochondria for our discussion today is that mitochondria have a shelf life. They basically have a lifespan and they don't want to outlive that lifespan. So there is an optimal amount of time that a mitochondria is meant to be alive. And if they outlive that, they kind of become dysfunctional. Or if we have premature mitochondrial death, or destruction, then there we have a lack of energy. So there, there's a fine balance there. It comes again back to that homeostasis, that there's a very fine balance within the cell and also within the mitochondria to maintain that homeostasis. But let's talk about energy for a minute. So I did talk about why mitochondria are important as far as them being the producers of energy in the form of ATP within a cell. Well, let's talk about why neurons or why the central nervous system needs energy. The main reasons. So the main reasons that the there are energy demands in the central nervous system is one for neurotransmitter, those chemicals I mentioned, to release them from one neuron and to be accepted by another neuron. There, That requires energy. And then the other big consume consumer of energy are the oligodendrocytes in the production of the myelin. You're probably one of the leading consumers of energy in the brain. So lack of mitochondria, dysfunctional mitochondria, just make this connection. Lack of energy, lack of nerve transmission, and lack of myelin production. All right, so now let's let's go back to those mitochondria again. So I mentioned those mitochondria produce that energy in the form of ATP. Well, important for today's discussion is the fact that a byproduct of that energy production system via the electron transport chain within the mitochondria spits out what we call reactive oxygen species, which is a free radical and is going to be the main topic of our or the main purpose of our conversation today as it relates to oxidative stress. So the the process of producing energy in the form of ATP, which allows nerves to connect uh, to communicate with each other and also produces the wrap around the nerves in the form of myelin, produces that reactive oxygen species, which is a free radical. So a free radical is just an unstable molecule. So it just means it has one extra electron. Now everything comes in pairs. So when you have one extra electron on a molecule, it's either going to be stealing electrons from other molecules or it's going to be giving electrons away, which in turn is going to make other molecules unstable and can cause problems. So if you have too much production in the mitochondria, that causes problems within the cell. But 
always looking for that balance of that homeostasis, there is a system in place that will neutralize those free radicals. And that is called our antioxidant defense system. Part of that antioxidant defense system are enzymes that are located in the mitochondria and in the cells that will help to neutralize those free radicals. So good news is, is that our bodies are extremely resilient. Um, so again, none of these videos that I make on health or, you know, lifestyle things should ever scare anyone. I do believe for those people that get in those rabbit holes or those experts that put these videos out that just fear fear monger everyone into like you have to eat certain foods and do all these things and I'm guilty of that sometimes but I always have to remember that our bodies and our cells are extremely resilient so there are lots of systems in place that prevent things from getting out of balance or when we get out of balance that bring them back into balance and the antioxidant defense system is one of those things but unfortunately and Part of this is just part of the aging process. We do start to develop an imbalance just with normal aging. But what happens when we have too much reactive oxygen species or free radical in the antioxidant defense system just cannot keep up? That is when we end up with oxidative stress. Now, what causes this to happen? So we have to go back to those free radicals. Again, I know I talked about the mitochondria and how they are the main producers or one of the producers of those free radicals or the, in particular, the reactive oxygen species. But there are other things that produce free radicals as well. One is that they are secreted from immune cells. You remember I talked about those immune cells and how there are chemicals that or molecules that are released that activate those immune cells or deploy those immune cells. Part of the function of those immune cells is to go to an area of infection, wrap up anything that doesn't belong there that's foreign and destroy it and carry it away. Simplified. Well, it makes sense that if that those immune cells are killing another cell and removing it from our body, that reactive oxygen species might be helpful. So immune cells release uh, free radicals. So that's another important aspect or how we end up with free radicals in our system are infections. But obviously just inflammation in general, especially like that chronic inflammation, that will also put us in a state of oxidative stress where we have more free radicals than that antioxidant system can keep up with. Mental stress will also can also create an environment of oxidative stress. And again, remember, I'm sticking mainly with the neurons in the brain at this point. Some cancers can cause this and aging. So I've mentioned that before. It is just a normal part of the aging process. Simplified, our cells really just become less efficient. Now, at this point, these might be kind of no-brainers, but the other ways that we end up with oxidative stress or we have more free radicals than we do antioxidants are pollutants, cigarette smoking. These are things from the environment that actually we allow into our body. Certain medications can cause this. Smoked meats and, of course, alcohol. Uh, household cleaning products, all of that, letting that stuff into our body. I think probably the main mechanism is that it activates our uh, uh, immune cells. And then those immune cells are what release that uh, reactive oxygen species that I mentioned earlier. So let's just make a few more connections of how mitochondria, the brain, and oxidative stress, how they're all kind of intermingled and why this all matters for all of you is that the brain is probably more susceptible to oxi oxidative stress or mo more vulnerable than outside of the brain and the spinal cord. And that's because it has the highest energy demand. So I touched on that a little bit earlier, but 20% of the energy demand of our entire body is devoted to our brain. So that means that there's more mitochondria in the neurons in the brain. So obviously when there's more mitochondria and more of that 
ATP electron transport chain that I mentioned earlier, more of that going on, you're just spitting out more reactive oxygen species. So that's another reason why it's more susceptible to oxidative stress. And because there is more of this reactive oxygen species, being spit out, it can it is makes the mitochondria in the neurons in the brain more susceptible to damage. Damaged mitochondria in the brain. They there's two things that happen when a mitochondria becomes inefficient or dysfunctional. Is you produce more reactive oxygen species, so more free free radicals and less. Energy. So you're getting more of the bad stuff and you're not getting the energy to meet the demands of those highly demanding neurons in your brain. So, how is this all implicated in MS? those that myelin is attacked and what we know or what the literature has reported is that they have found that people that have ms they have a continuous production of reactive oxygen species that apparently looks different than someone with a healthy brain or someone that doesn't have ms so that is creating that imbalance which is creating the oxidative stress now, when it comes to stroke, extremely simplified, but you had that blood clot, blood flow is cut off. That means oxygen was cut off to that cell that activates the immune cells in the brain. And then there's a ton of cascades, multiple cascades of events that occur in the days and weeks and months following that event or that blood clot, even once blood flow is restored that causes a lot of problems one thing that we know happens is that there is it, the blood brain barrier is degraded or broken down and so again those peripheral immune cells are able to infiltrate or get into the brain and cause a lot of what i've already talked about it will also attack the myelin but also you will get this overproduction of free radicals in the brain. So that is how oxidative stress is implicated in stroke. That's just big picture as to how this all relates and why understanding oxidative stress is so, so, so important. All right. And now before we dive into what to do about it, let's just bring this all full circle. So just to review, neurons need energy to transmit signals, whether that's sensory, motor, or entire neural networks. They need energy to release those chemicals from one neuron to the other so that neurons can communicate with each other. Mitochondria produce the energy. That energy is not only used for cell signal transmission, but that it's also used for myelin formation and timely cell death necessary to maintain brain homeostasis. Free radicals are a byproduct of cellular metabolism or a byproduct of this energy production in the mitochondria. The antioxidant defense mechanism or defense system is necessary to keep this these reactive oxygen species or these free radicals in check or to neutralize them. When you get a mismatch or they're out of balance, you end up with dysfunctional mitochondria, which produce more reactive oxygen species and less ATP and cell death. And then all of that is important when it comes to MS and stroke, where there's potentially a breakdown in the blood brain barrier, which allows this process to kind of spit out or generate more and more free radicals, causing more and more damage to the brain, less and less energy, less efficient neurons, less signaling. Now that we know all that, what protects the brain, those neurons in our brain that allow every function in our body to happen, what protects them from oxidative stress? Well, it's really simple. So this was a long video for a very simple answer. Oxidative stress is bad because you have too many free radicals and you don't have an antioxidant system to keep up. How do you prevent oxidative stress? Well, you prevent it by decreasing the amount of free radicals so that everything's in balance and the anti oxidant defense system can keep up and neutralize those free radicals. Very, very simple. Now, how do you get there? Like, what are the actual behaviors that you need to do? Well, in this video, to keep things super simple, uh, all we're going to talk about are 
things that to eliminate. Now, let me explain that. So there's a lot of talk about antioxidants and this antioxidant and that antioxidant. And there's a ton of information out there on antioxidants. There's a lot of people out there that want to sell you really expensive products. But I think for this video, I want to focus on how do you reduce free radicals? So instead of upregulating your antioxidants, which it's controversial, and I'll explain why. How do you just reduce the free radicals, which in my mind makes more sense because it's more logical that it work, that it actually works. And here's what I mean is that we haven't produced or the scientific community hasn't yet produced a, a strong body of evidence that suggests that taking in antioxidants, so getting antioxidants and putting them in your body, that th those people have better health, less disease. So what I take away from that is that uh, they haven't really proven yet that like when you take it, antioxidants in, that they're actually getting to the exact point i.e., or in this example, the mitochondria, and doing what they need to do to build up that antioxidant system. But all of that being said, there are a number of things that we all can do, excluding for now the topic of getting in more antioxidants to build up our antioxidant defense system. There are things that we can all do today to reduce the production of reactive oxygen species or free radicals in the brain. And that's what I really want to focus on today. And what are those things? Reduce exposure to toxins of all kinds. If you smoke, quit smoking. I know that's easy for me to say and hard for you to do, especially if you're someone that's been smoking for a long time. But step one is deciding in your head that it's worth it. So that's why I give these long explanations, because for me, when I make lifestyle choices, when I understand what's going on inside my body, it is easier for me to make choices. So first, if you are a smoker, just, you know, you have to decide in your mind that you actually want to quit and you actually want to be a non-smoker and then just take small steps, you know, talk to your doctor about it. There are things that they can do to help you to quit smoking, but definitely if you're a smoker, especially if you're a smoker and you have MS, if you smoke anything that's including cannabis um, and the electric cigarettes, if you smoke anything, you are getting this overproduction of free radicals in your body, which are damaging your cells, decreasing conduction, just to review, um, and ending in causing premature cell death, but definitely quit smoking if you can. And here's the big one. And again, no one is perfect at this, but eliminate all processed foods. Now, if you live in America, this is not easy. So I'm sure there are opportunities for all of us to find those processed foods and get them out of our diet, especially if you have MS. I think it's as beneficial as all the medications that you're taking. Eliminate all processed foods. Anything that has been through a third party between the farm and your mouth, if it does not look like it did when they pulled it out of the ground, then it has been processed. Along those same lines, I would eliminate all white sugar, anything fructose. So white sugar, brown sugar, try and get it out of your diet. It is, it is causing damage to the cells in your brain, decreasing conduction and ultimately causing the brain fog potentially leading to the brain fog or contributing to the brain fog, the depression, lack of movement, poor energy, fatigue, things like that. So get rid of white sugar if you can. And this should go without saying alcohol. Alcohol is toxic. So it's definitely increasing your reactive oxygen species. And I think this is all uh, like kind of a continuum. So if you have multiple of these things, even more reason that you should not just cut back on alcohol, but eliminate alcohol. If you've had a stroke or MS, you already have an imbalance. So I think it's even more important um, to eliminate things such as alcohol. And then some things that are controversial, and I really think this comes down to because each individual person might have certain allergies to certain things. But some people do say that dairy can create some oxidative stress, dairy products. Some some literature says eggs. But again, I'm not too concerned about that. I think the big ones are to 
eliminate processed foods. If there's anything you can do to improve your chances of recovery and decrease the amount of impact that this is your disease progression, if you have MS or Parkinson's disease is having on your body is to eliminate processed foods and eliminate white sugar and eliminate alcohol and stop smoking. Those would be the main four. The next one is to get adequate sleep. So, so, so important. If you're not getting seven to nine hours of quality sleep, or you snore, or you have sleep apnea, or you suspect you might have sleep apnea, then um, definitely get that checked out and try and get your sleep uh, back on track to where you're getting good quality seven to nine hours of sleep at night along those same lines, what helps to kind of set our circadian rhythm is to get daylight early in the morning. So that doesn't have a direct relationship to oxidative stress, but I do think it's important to keep your body, your sleep cycle, sleep-wake cycle on track with the circadian rhythm, which is super important to um, just overall health, growth hormone, BDNF. A lot of you ask me about that production of that um, or upregulation of uh, BDNF, it comes down to quality sleep. So I definitely think quality sleep is super important. So big picture, let's just start with the foundation of what sleep is or the definition of sleep. Sleep is the natural, easily reversible absence of wakefulness and by the loss of consciousness of one's surroundings. So the key words in there are the natural, easily reversible periodic state of the absence of consciousness. And that will be important when we get a little bit deeper into this topic of sleep. And still sticking big picture, this state, periodic state of the loss of consciousness is divided up into stages. These stages are non-REM or non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep. And we basically kind of go through these stages throughout the night. During non-REM sleep, we're kind of falling deeper and deeper into sleep with the last stage of non-REM sleep being the deepest sleep, and we call that slow wave sleep. And then that's followed by rapid eye movement sleep, which is a state of arousal similar to when we're awake, but there are some subtle differences and we'll get into that as well. There's not a whole lot that goes on as far as bodily functions in stages one and two. But the golden ticket is that stage three sleep, non-REM sleep, which is the deepest sleep that we encounter throughout the night. As I mentioned, this is also called slow wave sleep. During non-REM sleep or N3 sleep, our muscle tone decreases, our pulse rate decreases, and our breathing rate decreases. Other key characteristics of the stage three non-REM sleep is that 90% of growth hormone is released during this stage of sleep. Our body shifts from primarily sympathetic to parasympathetic, so we have an autonomic, we have a change in our autonomic nervous system. So again, just to review for some of you, sympathetic is that flight or fight system, and parasympathetic is what they call that rest and digest part of the autonomic system. So we're going from that fight or flight system into that parasympathetic or that rest and digest system becoming more active. And again, this is the deepest sleep we will experience throughout the night. And this accounts for 10 to 25 percent of the sleep cycle. Now, after that deep sleep, our body transitions into what we call REM sleep. REM sleep accounts for approximately 18 to 25% of the sleep cycle. This stage of sleep, we're the most alert and it's very similar to being awake with one big difference that our muscles are pretty much paralyzed with the exception of our eye muscles and our breathing muscles. Unlike the deepest part of sleep during this stage of sleep, the heart rate increases. They also believe that REM sleep is integral for procedural memory and the memory of motor skills. One other key difference with this part of sleep is that the amygdala becomes active. And when we get into some of the benefits of sleep, I'll go into this a little bit more. Um, but the amygdala is basically or is for the most part, responsible for kind of processing emotions. So that's another key difference with this stage of sleep. And we usually don't hit REM sleep until we've been asleep for about 90 minutes. Now, what drives this system or what drives us to go into this unconscious state? Well, first, let's just get underneath the skin real briefly and real big picture. There are several brain areas involved, primarily the brainstem, 
the hypothalamus, the cortex, the forebrain, and then there's also some activity in the thalamus and the amygdala, as I stated earlier. So all of these brain areas, for the most part, are in constant communication with each other to keep us awake during the day and to keep us asleep at night. And then on top of that, we have neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are basically chemicals that allow those brain areas to communicate with each other. So areas of the brain, they can't speak in a language. So instead of using spoken language, it simplified. They use neurotransmitters to kind of communicate with each other. Some neurotransmitters are excitatory and they will turn on a nerve to send an impulse to another brain area and sometimes, in some cases, communicate that that brain area now needs to do something. And in some cases, neurotransmitters are inhibitory, in which case a nerve impulse is kind of shut off or that communication stops, which also does have its own kind of cascade of events when one brain area does this or sends an inhibitory signal. So the excitatory neurotransmitters that we're gonna that you that's good to be familiar with if you care about this topic of sleep are the excitatory neurotransmitters, which include norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, and histamine, and then inhibitory neurotransmitters, which include GABA and adenosine. And we're going to go in a little bit further into kind of what those neurotransmitters do a little bit later, but it's just good to know that excitatory neurotransmitters turn a brain circuit on. Inhibitory neurotransmitters, for the most part, generally speaking, will turn kind of a neuro circuit off. And then there are also hormones involved that either keep us awake during the day or help us to sleep at night. And those are melatonin, which a lot of you are familiar with, that helps us with our sleep drive or that pressure to go to sleep. Cortisol aids in alertness. And then there's other hormones that are just regulated during sleep. Uh, the important ones to know are leptin and ghrelin, and we'll get into what those are. But the big key ones that play the biggest role with arousal and going to sleep are cortisol, keeping us awake, and keeps us in that state of unconsciousness. Now, why is all this important? Primarily, knowing that there's so many neurotransmitters and hormones involved and brain areas involved, it's really, really critical to understand this because if you've had damage to your brain or you are in the midst of or dealing with a neurodegenerative condition, in my mind, I don't think there's any way that some of this system is not possibly slightly impaired. And so I feel like doing a deep dive or having a better understanding of sleep in general could play a critical role in your recovery, but also might be important if what areas of the areas of the brain that are involved with you could potentially be causing some sleep disturbances or causing some sleep inefficiency. And we'll get into what that is a little bit later, but just something to be aware of. So now we've gone into kind of the definition of sleep that we're gonna stick with for this video, the stages of sleep, some of the behind the scenes of what's going on in our body when we're sleeping. But now the big question is, how is sleep regulated? What allows us to stay awake during the day and fall asleep at night? And I promise you this is really important, especially when we get to some of the lifestyle modifications or some of the lifestyle things that you can do to help to make sure that you're getting that good quality sleep. But what exactly regulates this system. So I talked about those neurotransmitters and if you can envision kind of like a switchboard from the little house on the prairie days, I just visualize that switchboard operator turning all the phones on and off. I kind of visualize that that's what this system looks like and there's switches going on and off, turning neurotransmitters on or brain areas on and off by releasing certain neurotransmitters. The only difference is, is there is no human controlling that switchboard. So in place of that human, we have other systems or cues that our system is getting to help regulate or be the one to help tell the brain what areas need to be switched on and switched off. 
And again, we're still stick sticking really big picture and keeping this extremely simple, but we have external cues and we have internal body cues. Some of the internal cues are we have an internal body clock that matches up with the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is a 24 hour cycle that's based on the sun. And then we have something called sleep homeostasis. So it's just a built in system that the longer we're awake, the, the more drive there's going to be for our brain to make us fall asleep or transition our brain and our body from a state of wakefulness to a state of natural unconsciousness. Now, both of these systems are influenced by light. So light stimulates a part of the hypothalamus that actually activates uh, what they call like our ascending arousal system, which keeps us awake. And that's going to become important again when we get to some of the lifestyle things that you can do to help you stay awake. That is probably, I would say, probably the most important. These two systems or these in, this internal body clock is also influenced by social activities, meals, and our work schedule. And generally speaking, our body is designed or kind of set up to get seven to nine hours of sleep in every 24 hour period. So now that we kind of understand these internal body clocks, I want to talk about sleep drive for a minute. So whether it's based on the circadian rhythm or the sun, or it's based on the sleep-wake homeostasis, there are some internal processes that are going on that increase our drive to sleep. So increase the body's uh, natural tendency to want to fall asleep. And one mechanism that's in place that does this is our brainstem releases GABA. So I mentioned earlier that GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, kind of turns off that system, that arousal system. So that's one way that drives us to want to fall asleep or our body to go unconscious at night, preferably. The other kind of mechanism that's in place is adenosine. Adenosine is a byproduct of cellular energy metabolism. So when our cells are very active, they are releasing this adenosine. Adenosine also drives us to sleep. So adenosine is typically very low in the morning and builds up throughout the day. So that drive to fall asleep or to naturally go unconscious is strongest after you've been awake for a prolonged period of time. And the other thing that a mechanism that helps to naturally drive our body into a state of unconsciousness is melatonin. Melatonin release is primarily dictated or activated by darkness. So lots of light coming in through our eyes, melatonin decreases, melatonin secretion decreases. As there is more darkness in our eyes, melatonin increases. So not that I'm telling you anything new. If you've been watching any type of news or anything, this is a big topic, but screen time at night, that's one reason why that could disrupt your quality sleep at night. So those are kind of the systems in place or the mechanisms that help us to fall asleep. But again, big picture, why does all of this matter? Well, all of this matters because sleep impacts every function of our body. In particular, or primarily, the ones that we're going to go over today are how sleep, good quality sleep, impacts our mood, impacts our cardiovascular system positively when we're getting adequate sleep, regulates our blood sugar, hugely important in maintaining a healthy body weight and maintaining the health of our blood vessels. Brain plasticity, which I know is hugely important to a lot of you that watch this channel. Immune function, and as I even stated earlier, maintaining a healthy body weight. So let's start with improved mood. So how is sleep and mood kind of associated with each other? Well, first and foremost, if any of you have ever been sleep deprived, you know you're a little bit more on the grumpy side, at least I know I am. But beyond that, sleep helps our body to restore, so obviously that has a huge impact on our mood. But even more than that, they know that the amygdala is pretty active during that REM part of sleep, which I had, which I had mentioned earlier. So potentially another way that 
positive mood or a healthy mood is associated with good quality sleep is that maybe we're processing our emotions a little bit more during that REM sleep. They do know that people that have psychiatric disorders or have depression or anxiety, those things, they've done sleep studies on people that are dealing with those kind of mood disorders, and they know that their sleep, they are sleep deprived primarily, they're missing REM sleep. Moving on, how is sleep associated with having a healthy heart? Well, slow wave sleep, as I mentioned, that's that N3 or that non-REM stage three sleep, also called slow wave sleep. During that stage of sleep, our heart rate decreases, which I said earlier, our blood pressure pressure decreases, which I said earlier, and our breathing rate decreases. But the key characteristic of this stage is we switch from that sympathetic system to our parasympathetic system, which is that rest and digest. And possibly the just being able to allow our blood vessels to rest helps them to restore and repair so that our smooth muscles in our blood vessels and our heart maintain their structural integrity and perform optimally. The other way or reason that we know that uh, a healthy heart is correlated with good quality sleep is there is a lot of evidence that suggests that poor sleep quality or sleep deprivation increases the risk of cardiovascular disease by 63%. Sleep also regulates our blood sugar. And at best guess, the mechanism behind this is that we release insulin while we're sleeping and insulin promotes glucose that's in the blood to go into the cells. Without insulin, glucose just sits in the blood. So lack of sleep means that there's decreased insulin production, which increases blood glucose. Now, they've done studies on this in healthy individuals and as little as three nights of sleep deprivation, and those healthy individuals showed signs of insulin resistance. Now, brain plasticity, probably the reason that uh, I, the, the most, the important reason or the reason that I think this video is so important to all of you, because I rarely hear patients talking about their doctors talking about sleep. So that's what really got me to do this deep dive into this. And the further I went into it, the more I realized how valuable this is and kind of was shocked that there's, I don't hear more doctors talking about this with patients that have had a stroke or are living with a neurologic disease, but we know, or the scientists know, or the data shows that slow wave sleep is associated with memory consolidation. In other words, when someone practices something during the day, there is data that shows that those same brain areas are reactivated at night. Uh, One study that I found on this where they did look at two groups of people. One group of people, they gave them a task, a learning task at night and gave them that same task in the morning. And then they gave a group a task in the morning and they gave them that same task at night. And the group that had the sleep in between the two sessions actually performed better on that second session versus the other group, which had like a restful wakefulness in between those two sessions. So that's a little bit of evidence that suggests that there is something going on during our sleep that helps to consolidate those memories and helps with motor learning. Just a side note, with that experiment, it was a motor task that they gave the two groups. But beyond that, there are other things that we know about sleep, such as the release of growth hormone, which also helps in all areas of our body, but especially in brain health and repair and healing and cognition, as well as other cells and tissues in our body. So there's plenty of different mechanisms that are out there as far as potential theories of what's going on with our sleeping with our, while we're sleeping that further drives home my opinion that I think taking sleep seriously and really focusing on getting good quality sleep is so, so, so important. The other area that is hugely influenced by our sleep is our immune function. So the researchers or the scientists show that during while we're sleeping, we increase our immune cell 
production, the part of the theory or the rationale that is believed to be why this happens at night is one, it's kind of like when we're sleeping, our body can kind of shift resources so we can build that immune system up. Now, I know what you guys are probably thinking because I just did a video on the immune system that, you know, isn't it bad to have immune cells releasing. And in this case, what they think or they believe is happening is it's kind of like you have cells that deploy to fight something. So that'd be like your military going into battle. But then you also have cells that are going out there to train. And so they kind of think that these immune cells are just gathering data and just making our immune system more robust when they're acting at night. The other theory or mechanism that I found as to why this might happen at night is they believe that melatonin has a neuroprotective effect. So because we release more melatonin at night, which helps to us to fall asleep, that that is another reason potentially why this immune system System tries to do their training kind of at night. So those were two different papers that I read as to why this might happen or why we might have this increased release of immune cells at night. And then the last, not the only one, this is not inclu all inclusive, but the other area that I think is important of as far as why sleep is so important to our bodily function is maintaining body weight. And that really has to do with two hormones called ghrelin and leptin. Ghrelin is a hormone that is released from our stomach and kind of sends a signal to our brain that we're hungry. So the way I remember that is just ghrelin is like a grumbling stomach. And then leptin is released from fat tissue and kind of suppresses ghrelin. So it doesn't want your body to be hungry if it knows it has stored fat that it can use. And while we are sleeping, they have found that acute sleep deprivation increases the release of ghrelin. So basically telling us we're hungry when potentially we're not needing energy. And then chronic sleep deprivation uh, suppresses leptin, basically, again, not telling our body when lept if leptin tells our body that we don't need any more energy if leptin is suppressed then that's going to tell our body possibly that we need more energy the other potential reason that we could uh, gain weight, the people that are sleep deprived gain weight, is because you're awake more hours. So there's just more hours in a 24 hour period to eat. So you're just your caloric intake is higher. Those are some potential reasons why they know there is a strong association between sleep deprivation and obesity. So now we know what sleep is. Hopefully, we know what the stages of sleep are. We know the positive impact that sleep has on our body. Now let's go into sleep deprivation and sleep deficiency. Sleep deprivation is basically just decreased duration of sleep, meaning the number of hours that you are in bed is shortened, meaning under that seven hours. And then there's sleep inefficiency. So sleep inefficiency is characterized by fragmented sleep meaning that you're having these spikes or these arousals throughout the night and or inefficient sleep means that you're getting less sleep than the number of hours you're in bed. So if sleep deficiency is decreased number of hours in bed, sleep inefficiency in addition to those frequent arousals is when you're in bed but your sleep duration or the amount of time that you're actually asleep is shortened. Some of the symptoms that are associated with sleep deprivation are slower thinking, reduced attention span, memory problems, risky behaviors has also been correlated with sleep deprivation or showed to be linked with sleep deprivation, lack of energy, and mood changes. Depression, anxiety, irritability, and an overall reported mental stress. So in addition to kind of the problems that I went through when I talked about the benefits of sleep, when sleep is deprived, how those systems break down a little bit, in addition to that, they also know that pain is linked with sleep deprivation, meaning that people that experience chronic pain uh, also report sleep deprivation. And the other problem with sleep deprivation is diabetes. And we kind of went into that when I went into the blood sugar control, but that is also closely correlated with sleep deprivation or sleep inefficiency. So now bringing it back to most of you that have had a stroke, why is this such a problem with stroke? 
well, we know there's a 50% higher chance of having depression after a stroke. But beyond that, it will impact your ability to participate in your therapies, your ability to for recall or memory or memory consolidation when you're learning all of this new information. But they also know that people have who have sleep disorders have worse stroke outcomes and a higher incidence of stroke reoccurrence. So how do you know if you have sleep deprivation or you have inefficient sleep? Well, one is, is to ask your doctor for a sleep study. Now I will tell you this video is not to scare you, it's just to make you aware of certain things that to have a discussion with your doctor. Um, most of the evidence suggests that if you have a sleep disturbance or a sleep disorder that resulted from your stroke, meaning that your stroke may have contributed to a sleep disorder, it'll usually be in the acute phase and resolve. So just something to keep in mind. But on the flip side, there is a strong link or correlation between sleep deprivation and stroke. So if you're someone that maybe you believe that maybe you didn't get good quality sleep before your stroke and you've never had a sleep study, a sleep study would be a great way to know if you're sleep, if you have inefficient sleep. But some other things that might be indicators that you're not getting good quality sleep is if you snore, if your mouth is dry in the morning, that means you're primarily a mouth breather. Sometimes that indicates that you're not getting good quality sleep, acid reflux, and a history of stroke. So now, if you know that you have a problem with your sleep or you're, you maybe want to improve your quality of sleep, hopefully I've convinced you that this is enough compelling information to for you to pay more attention to your sleep. Listen, in preparing for this video, I have made probably five or six different changes in my daily life to improve my quality of sleep when I read all the benefits to sleep. So hopefully I've compelled some of you as well to give this a strong look to improve your overall health, but to also improve your recovery after a stroke. But what are some things that you can do to improve your overall quality of sleep? One is to have a consistent sleep schedule, including on the weekends, meaning going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time. Remember I talked about those internal body clocks? They like routine. Our body processes better. If you can think of it this way, probably all of those systems, those internal body clocks and responding to external cues, it's kind of like an algorithm and it's almost like we have backup systems to backup systems. So we have three or four different ways that our body tries to integrate information so that if one system's not working well, another one will kind of kick in and produce that drive to go to sleep. But um, being consistent means that you don't, there's not as much error going on. So if you go to bed at the same time, you're getting that kind of circadian rhythm kind of into a flow, as well as that sleep-wake homeostasis. So going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time every single day, seven days a week. As far as your room is concerned, uh, they suggest to keep it as quiet as possible. This probably has to do with our flight or fight system that is back in Stone Age days or historic days when we had to um, protect ourselves from predators that that engages your sympathetic system, which is that fight or flight system, stimuli. So sounds and things like that that are unfamiliar probably stimulate that system even if it's not fully waking you up where you can remember it in the morning. So they say to keep your room as quiet as possible. You want to keep your room as dark as possible. So darkness will increase that re release of melatonin. We talked about that earlier. Melatonin helps to helps with getting you into that unconscious, natural unconscious state. Have a relaxing environment. So that again will take you out of that sympathetic system and kind of drive you into that parasympathetic system, out of that fight or flight and into that rest and digest system. So as much as you can, and then along those same lines, not having any technology in your room. So those devices are associated with being awake and aroused and being in ready mode or learning mode or work mode. And remember I talked about those internal body clocks and some of the cues they get are from our 
work schedules and our habits or our social schedules. So there is some outside influence from our behaviors that influences this internal body clock as well. So no technology in the room. I'm working on this, so I promise you I am right there with you if this one's going to be a hard one for you because it's a hard one for me. Other things that you can do is to avoid large meals at night. Again, our food schedule also dictates whether or not we need to be awake or asleep. So if we have a lot of food in our st stomach, it kind of triggers our arousal systems because our body kind of thinks that we need to be awake. There's something we need to do with that energy. So try and stop eating three hours before bedtime. Avoid caffeine after two to three o'clock. Caffeine blocks that adenosine I talked about earlier from doing what it needs to do, which is what helps us to fall asleep at night. So when you do that, you're decreasing that sleep drive or that ability to fall asleep. So caffeine, no caffeine after two or three o'clock, no alcohol. They have found that in healthy individuals who drink alcohol, that disrupts REM sleep. And remember, REM sleep is really important for memory consolidation and learning new motor skills. So try and avoid alcohol. And the other thing is exercise. Exercise is important for so many reasons. I know I've talked about it before, but it definitely helps with stress and anxiety, which could be some reasons why you can't fall asleep and stay asleep at night. It's just that your mind is racing. So it definitely helps with that. But beyond that, I also think it helps with that sleep drive because you are, what I think is you're just, there's more adenosine, which is builds up through cell metabolism. I just think exercise probably influences that whole system. And again, increases that sleep drive. And then sunlight, get sunlight first thing in the morning, direct sunlight on your skin without sunglasses for about 10 minutes. This does a bunch of things. It increases that arousal system and potentially influences that sleep homeostasis. So remember, the as soon as you wake up, your body is slowly getting increasing its drive for sleep throughout the day. So by getting that sunlight first thing in the morning, it's kind of like you're getting that system going early and so that you will have that sleep drive or you'll want to fall asleep at night. So sunlight early in the morning, super, super valuable. If you liked that video, check out these two videos down here. If you want even more support or ideas on how to improve your overall health and movement quality, check out our gold membership program. As a member of that program, you will get access to over 300 exercises that are not here on YouTube, as well as access to our monthly live Q&A where you can get your specific questions answered. I enjoyed spending time with you all today, and I will see you here on YouTube in the next video.